Good morning, we are live on Facebook. Uh, hope uh, some of you are here to join us in today's uh, workshop to make some Bronze Age bling. Uh, our festival has gone down really well so far, so we're really chuffed with what's gone on. And I hope you've enjoyed finding out a bit more about some of the things that have been happening uh, across Dartmoor in terms of its heritage and its wildlife. Uh, so on Monday we kick things off by making our Bronze Age dagger. Today we're going to make some jewellery. So can you see anything different from the other day if you tuned into that workshop? Well of course I'm in the kitchen now and I've moved from the, uh, the other room. Uh, but also I'm wearing some lovely Bronze Age bling here. If you can just see I've got uh, what looks like a tin bead uh, and then some amber beads and then some shale beads around there. So if I give you a bit of a closer look there, you can just see those there. And, and these are based on a, an archaeological discovery that was made in 2011, so just nine years ago, up at Whitehorse Hill, right up in the middle of the moor, just where the dart rises. And this amazing burial kist uh, was uncovered and excavated and it has led to all kinds of amazing discoveries about Bronze Age Dartmoor. So hopefully we'll talk a bit about those through the course of the morning, uh, but we need to sort of crack on uh, with our workshop today. Uh, so if you're going to join in and take part, then let us know. I can see there's a few people there. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Beth Pugsley. Good to see that some people there joining in. Um, I hope you're going to take part and uh, have a go with us. Uh, what you're going to need, uh, just in case you've not got things together in your kitchen, you are going to need to be in your kitchen, you're going to need 125 grams of plain flour. You are going to need 70 grams of salt. Something to mix it all in. And you're going to need uh, a bit of space and also you're going to need uh, some food colourings here. So I've got some lovely red orange and black food colourings which will come in lovely of course they stay in your hands as well so I have to have a cloth on hand to make sure I don't get too messy uh, also you're going to need some kind of cutter I found some some old plumbing fittings that I think will make quite nice cutting so that cutters so that'll be quite good uh, and you'll need some foil for our tin beads as well so that's great. So we've got all the things that we need here. Uh, so we can start thinking about getting on this. But let me just show you uh, on the table. I've got some pictures of what these jewels actually look like. So if I can just pull them up here. So you should just be able to see here. If I hold that up to the camera, you can see the jewels, the beads here. These are the, what was discovered within the burial kist. And you can see in the centre there, they've been arranged to look like the necklace. The tin bead is in the middle, amber beads next to it, and then uh, the shale beads next to that. And if you can see those wooden discs as well, those wooden discs are what we think are ear, ear spacers. So you may see people walking around now who sort of stretch their ears and they've inserted these big sort of discs. Well, we believe that uh, Bronze Age people probably did the same thing as well. So incredible. We're not making those today, though. We're just going to focus on the jewellery. And, of course, we haven't got amber lying around. It doesn't, we don't get it in this country. Amber comes uh, from the Baltic uh, countries. Uh, so that's another important thing that was discovered, was that actually our Bronze Age ancestors were having to trade with these Baltic regions. Now, maybe not directly, maybe there were people, there were tradings with the, uh, the south coast and then we were going over to Dorset to trade with them. Uh, but still really fascinating uh, there. Okay, let's have a go at making this then. Um, so I've measured out my ingredients already because I'm uh, conscious of the time. So I'm just gonna mix my flour into my bowl here like this. And I'm just going to pour the salt in as well. It seems like an awful lot of salt, but it will stop it all going off and going nasty later on. And I forgot to get a wooden spoon out, so I'm just going to put a spoon. I'm just going to basically just mix those together very lightly there. And then we're going to need to add some water to make those all join up and stick together. 
So I'm just going to sort of pour some water in. You just start to see it sort of come to a bit of a paste. So just stir that around a bit. You don't want to put too much water into it. The more water, the more it's going to have to dry as well. Uh, you can just let these air dry when you've made them, but actually it's probably easier to have them sort of cooking in the oven. So what we've done, or what I've done here, is I've just put the oven on at 200 degrees. So if you can hear a little buzz behind me, that's the oven kicking in. So I have now made my dough here. I've probably put a little bit too much water in today. It's a bit sticky, but that's okay. So it should end up looking a bit like this. And again, this was one of those things that we could have gone and got some, some of that fancy artist modeling clay that uh, you can put in the oven and it's all bright colors and things and it would be really easy and simple to do. Uh, but this is a bit more fun, isn't it? Sort of finding things that you've got in your house to make uh, these bits of archeology. span Right, so I've given it a good old squish a -roo. technical term. Oh, I think that looks good. Oh, so what I'm going to do here is because I want some, some orangey amber ones and I want some shale ones, I'm going to split it into the dough. So I'm just going to put half of it back in the bowl there for the minute. I'm going to put this in this bowl here like this. Now this is the bit where we can get a bit messy. We're going to put... Uh, we're going to make the, the red beads uh, at first because they are a little bit um, bigger. I haven't got a spoon big enough, to, a small enough to go in here, so I'm just going to dip some of this in. This is that fancy stuff here. Just smear it in. Try not to get any on your hands at this stage because it's really bright. And because I'm worried that that red is going to be too strong, I've also got a bit of orange as well that I'm going to mix in. And I'm not too worried that it will sort of be all over the place. I think the swirls of orange and red will probably look quite good. Now this is what you've got to be prepared to be messy with. Because I'm just going to squeeze and mix all this in. And it's going all over my hands. So if you are doing this, you probably need an apron on. I probably should have put my apron on first, shouldn't I, before I started doing this. Never mind, too late now. So you can start to see it's starting to colour up now as it takes all the colour that's as staining my hands. It's starting to make that nice little look here. Look, that's starting to look good, isn't it? Just keep working that. This is good where you've got lots of little helpers with you this morning. You can be getting them to sort of do some of this squishing. Right, I think that looks pretty even there. So what we can do now is we can start trying to make these into beads. Now my top tip for this is not to make the beads too big. I think the ones I made on this were a little bit large and you might be able to see that like they split a little bit there. So smaller is probably best, okay? So I'm gonna make, what am I gonna make? I'm gonna make about four or five of these beads. So there's one. You can try and make them as even as you can, but don't worry if they're not too even. They reckon the archaeologists reckon that these beads, these amber beads, may have been older than the necklace itself. Which is a bit strange, isn't it? So it's like almost that those, those amber beads were so precious that they just kept getting reused and reused. And we, and we know that because, uh, well, we don't know that, we, we guess that because they've uh, got lots of chips and things in them, as if they sort of have been um, you know, quite heavily worn over the years. The person that they were buried with uh, was, was it between 18 and 25, uh, we understand? So quite a young person, and we, we don't know whether it was a man or a woman. There wasn't enough uh, material there uh, in terms of the bones and, and the cremated remains to be able to, to tell exactly. 
But considering the fineness of some of the uh, the things she the person was buried with, uh, we kind of assume that perhaps she was a, a young woman, maybe a young Bronze Age princess or a, a chieftain's daughter. Uh, certainly helps us imagine that person, doesn't it, a bit, if we sort of think of them a bit like that. So I've made a handful of, I've made five there, I'm going to make six of these beads. That one's looking a bit weird. Okay, and this is where you're going to need a skewer of some kind, or possibly even a nail, actually. I'm going to use a nail just to sort of make a hole through it. Just shake the bead again a little bit more. I made, um, I just used a skewer last time and some of the beads stuck a little bit onto the skewer so I'm thinking do something with a bigger hole to start with and you should be all right. Once we've done these we'll get these in the oven because I say these will need a little bit longer to cook. And then we can go on to our, our um, shale beads because they're going to need, we need to produce lots of those. I think there were over 200 beads in the original uh, find, which is amazing, isn't it? You think sort of, I've just made six, so that feels like enough. But to craft all this many beads is amazing. Uh, and so I'm just going to just thread them onto a barbecue skewer. So hopefully you can see that. Okay, so there we go. We've got our beads on a barbecue skewer and I'm just gonna sit them in a tray like this. So you can see they're just gonna sit a bit like I've just created a kebab. That's basically what I'm doing. I'm just creating some little kebabs here and you can probably spend a little bit more time finessing these and making them look a little bit rounder if you like. Brilliant, so I'm just going to pop those in the oven. I'll put the timer on for 10 minutes so I don't forget about them. And I've got some more dough for doing something else with later if you fancy. So now we need to get on to the other bits. We need to get on to making our, our shale beads. So again, put our dough in the mix. Let's get some of the black out. That's a bit runnier, that black. Big dollop of black onto there like that. Should make it look rather nice. Just folding it in as if I'm making pastry, I think. I'm trying to remember old home, home economics lessons. Um, if you haven't got food colouring, don't worry. I should have said you can omit this stage and just make them in the plain dough. And of course, what you could do is just get some poster paints or some acrylic paints afterwards and paint them. So that would be a, a, a good alternative, wouldn't it? Now, this is starting to look good already. My hands are certainly looking lovely, aren't they? And I think that is looking pretty good, isn't it? That, that looks pretty good. This is the bit I'm going to need to make a bit of space. I'm going to need a little bit of flour. Just put my dough down here. Right, and let's roll it out. Flour hopefully will stop it sticking to the surface too much. Right. You need to get this quite thin, as thin as you can get it, if you can. So I would say that it's just about a millimetre and a half. Sounds quite precise, isn't it, that? Doesn't really matter if you're not that precise. But I'm going to put a little bit of this flour on the bottom of my baking tray here. And I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take some of these things that I've got here. As I say, this is just kind of things I had lying around in the shed, like little cutters. You could use a pen top or something like that. Probably something that's about a centimetre and a half, something like that, I think. Squeeze it in, and then you should end up with 
a little bead that looks a little bit like that, which you can use your skewer or your nail if you've got it there, poke a hole for it and then pop it into your tray. So there you go, there's one bead done. So we just need to do a whole load of these. So the archaeological uh, investigation was in 2011, so that's nine years ago. And it was an incredible find. As we mentioned on Monday, there was a big trend in the Victorian era to go out and do lots of investigations. People like Spence Bates, who uncovered that dagger, sort of loved to go and explore old burial cairns. But most of these burial cairns that they explored, they discovered had already been opened and whatever contents were in them had been removed. So by the time they got there, they just, they just find a couple of wheelbarrows of old bones and nothing much more. Uh, so when they discovered this kist uh, in 2011, it was, it was starting to erode out of the peat. And if they did nothing, we would have lost it completely. So the archaeologists came in, but they really just thought they were just going to find a few, a few bones, nothing much more. Nothing really survives in Dartmoor soils. So they were incredibly surprised when they started to excavate it and a bead fell out on the first day and they knew they had something a bit special there. So they decided they had to take a different approach and rather than excavating it there on site, they took the whole of the kist away with them to a lab and they then used forensic techniques to explore within this, uh, this kist. And that's incredible really. And what they, what they discovered uh, was amazing. They found lots of organic material. The, the conditions must have just been right to allow uh, things to survive and not rot away. So that's incredible in its first instance. So they found lots of incredible finds within there. Uh, what was amazing was that within this, uh, this kist, this stone box if you like, and you see those out on the moor, sort of where they've been opened up, uh, it had been uh, strewn with plants, so uh, more grass had been uh, cut and just laid out within the, uh, the, the kist, uh, but it had all been sort of uh, cut and lined up very nicely. And then there was, um, there was meadow sweet, which, you, which we see sort of in the hedgerows and damp places at this time of year. And what's incredible is they could date, they could date the uh, burial to about 1650 BC. And they can even tell us that actually this ceremony must have taken place in sort of uh, around September, late summer, September time, because of the pollen uh, on the meadow suite suggested that it was around that time. That is amazing, isn't it? To sort of be able to sort of tell that kind of information about, about it all. So now I've got lots of little discs here. So what else did they find within the, uh, the burial? Well, they, they found uh, the cremated remains of this young person and they were wrapped in a, an animal pelt. An animal pelt which actually turned out to be a bear skin. Imagine that. So whether that means there were bears roaming around at the time, whether they traded that, we don't know. Uh, there was a basket by the side of this, uh, of this bear pelt, and that contained some things that perhaps this person would need in some kind of afterlife. So it had, it was a, a lime basket, so made out of the bark of of lime, the lime bast, you know, woven together. And within that, there was a, a nettle and leather uh, kind of sash thing. I mean, we don't really know how it, uh, how it would have been worn, but it was some kind of sash, incredible work within it. Uh, there were these beads uh, that we found here. And there was also a, a uh, well, what we think could be either a wrist 
bracelet, uh, arm bracelet or a wrist bracelet made out of uh, woven cow hair with fine little tin beads within it as well. Incredible stuff. Right, I have a whole load of little beads here. I'm going to, I think to save time, I'm just going to thread them onto my skewer here rather than try and make a hole first. So I'm going to just thread them all on, and then I'm going to sort of do that, drop them into, just turn the timer off a second. It's important that these holes don't close up in the drying process, otherwise it makes it really hard to thread them onto a string. All the finds were, uh, were put on display in Plymouth uh, when, uh, when we could do, but we probably won't see them uh, again because they are so delicate. Uh, but what we have got is, a hot, is some replicas that were made as part of the process to understand all this. But those are going to be uh, on display very soon. Uh, we are just finishing off the, uh, the improvements at Postbridge Visitor Centre. And when that is finished, then you'll be able to come and see these finds, find out a bit more about this mysterious person and the incredible archaeology that has taken place to help us understand all this. Uh, so it's going to be well worth a trip up there to go and find out. And you can have a whole Bronze Age day while you're there because uh, we've got a trail around Postbridge uh, called the History Hunters Trail. So you could take your family out there. Uh, those of you who want to sort of go on a really long walk could probably walk out to Whitehorse Hill. Although you're probably better walking from Fernworthy, I think. It's a little bit closer. We get the idea. I'm going to put these in the oven, otherwise we're going to be here all day. I'm also just going to have a quick check on the ones, the beads I thought we have. Put on for another 10 minutes. So you can see, ow, that's quite hot still. Remember if you use a skewer, if you use a skewer, make sure if it's a wooden one, um, it doesn't burn your hand. If you're using a metal one, just be really careful. So I'm just giving these a little spin around. I can feel that they're a little bit soft on the, on the inside. I'm just turning them around to make sure that when they dry, they're going to come off the skewer. And we'll put that back in the oven. Look at my hands. What a mess. What a mess. I'll show you something else actually while I've got this out. Here we go. I can show you some of the other finds as well. So I told you that it was all displayed at Plymouth Museum and they did a, a teacher's pack. And if you search online, you can find this teacher's pack. I think we're going to put a link to it later in the day as well. Uh, and here we go got kind of the list of objects that uh, were found. So if I scroll up here, the first thing we can see here is the bear pelt. So it's incredible isn't it to see this sort of bear pelt here. That was what it was all wrapped up in. It took, it's taken quite a bit of research to decide that yes it was a bear. I think there are lots of uh, discussions in the science community. Here is the nettle and um, nettle and leather sash object. That no one quite knows how, how it was worn. So have a look at that. So sort of think a bit more about it. There's some information on this pack as well, so it'll let you know a bit more about it. And this is this is the cow hair and tin bracelet as well. So that is all woven cow hair. I mean that is incredible isn't it to imagine that kind of work to weave that together and to put those little beads in there. And also this basket as well. And I was reading about this basket. This is made out of lime bast. So that's the bit between the outside bark and the, uh, the inner tree. They peel that out and I think they have to do a lot of soaking with it and then they kind of weave it together. 
but it actually makes a very waterproof finish as well. So actually a waterproof basket would have been really important uh, out on the moor, wouldn't it? To sort of keep your, your precious belongings in. And here are the, is an amber bead and a shale bead as well there. So you can see how they've been looked after. You can see it's quite translucent. So we're not going to be able to capture that translucentness with, the, uh, with what we're doing today. But you get this sort of the idea of it. You could perhaps uh, put a bit of varnish on these or maybe even a bit of kitchen oil or something like that. So you probably have to watch that the kitchen oil didn't sort of uh, rub off onto your clothes as well. And these are the other beads that are in the necklace as well. So the tin bead is quite corroded, uh, but we've also got the shale bead there. Which reminds me, we need to get on and make our tin bead, don't we, while we are awake. And what I sort of suggested in the original plans was that actually we would use a bit of pasta or something like that and then and then just wrap it in foil. But of course, hand taken into account last night's tea. <laughs> we used all the pasta, it was very nice. Uh, but it does mean that I didn't have any pasta left, but I didn't panic because I thought actually what we can do is just take a sheet of tin foil like this, about this square. We just rip it like that. And then if we just fold it, so we're gonna fold it into about two centimeter strips over and over. Let's keep it as neat as we can. So you should end up with a silver strip that looks like this. And then all you need to do is wrap it around a pen like this, trying to keep it wrapping exactly where you had it. So it's all in one strip, that's what I mean. And what you can do with this last little bit is you can just sort of fold it in slightly. A perfect time and the cooker's going as well. So you could end up with it looking a bit more to a point and that way it will give us a little bit more shape to our bead as it wraps in. So you should end up with something that looks a little bit like that and You've got some glue, use some glue to stick it down, but probably the easiest thing is to use a bit of sellotape. And then we can just give it a bit of a squish, and then you've got your tin bead. So I think we're ready. Let's have a little look uh, at how things have been cooking. Oh, yeah, those beads, those shale beads are done. I think those are done. Those are done actually. I think I may have just overcooked the, uh, the first lot of beads. <laughs> so let's get ready. I need a cooling rack. I'm just going to. This is a bit you need to be really careful, isn't it? You don't want anyone to put burnt fingers doing this. So put those beads there. The same as the other ones. Put those on there to cool. So you may find they, they do stick on there, don't they? I did wonder about maybe putting a bit of flour on, uh, but I did smooth those up. Anyway, that's just what it is. So now we are ready to make our bead necklace. Uh, so I'm going to get a piece of string could probably use a finer piece of string than this piece that I've got here. This is quite chunky. There we go. So we have one bead on there. And then just I'm twisting the string as it goes through to try and make it go all the way through. So you can see it's really important to make the holes as big as you can when you make these, they do swell up. You might also find 
that some of your beads crack as you try and force a string through. They crack a bit. Don't worry, you can just use a bit of uh, PVA glue, stick those back together again. I would recommend you persevering with the string if you can, because it's going to be much more comfortable to wear. Right, I think I've nearly threaded enough on here for you to get the whole idea of what we have been doing. I'm, very, I'm holding that in the wrong place. There we are, our very own little necklace. Fantastic. All made out of salt dough and looking incredibly similar to the reconstruction uh, necklace and to the original beads themselves. So I hope you've had fun doing this today. Yeah, I hope you've had a great time while you've done this. And don't forget, uh, we've got our talk with Andy Crabb tomorrow. Tune into that. Uh, have a go at making Emma's blouse uh, when that video comes online. Uh, and be inspired by what we've been up to uh, this morning and go out and explore the art more and try to find yourself back in the Bronze Age, either in a Bronze Age house or looking at a stone row or, or just anywhere out on the moor, just to explore this beautiful place that's right on our doorstep. Enjoy Dartmoor and we shall see you very soon. Take care, see you now, bye bye.